Hello, friends, and welcome to this Good Friday devotional. Today, we will read Matthew 27, 33 through 56. But first, let's pause for prayer. Holy Father, we present ourselves to you as your children who need you desperately. We thank you, Lord, for reaching us, for helping us to know you, and for all the grace that you have given us and everything else in this life. We praise you and thank you. And now we ask that you would open our eyes to the scriptures and open our minds to the truth that is in them. We pray that we might be filled up with your word and thoughts about you through the day. We pray it in the strong name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Matthew 27, beginning with verse 33. When they came to the place called Golgotha, which means skull place, they gave him a drink of wine mixed with bitter herbs. When he tasted it, he refused to drink it. So they crucified him. They divided up his clothes by casting lots, and they sat down and kept watch over him there. And they placed the written charge above his head, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then they crucified two brigands alongside him, one on his right and one on his left. The people who were going by shouted blasphemies at Jesus. They shook their heads at him. So, they said, You were going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, were you? Save yourself if you're God's chosen son. Come down from the cross. The chief priests, too, and the scribes and the elders mocked him. He rescued others, they said, but he can't rescue himself. All right, so he's the king of Israel. Well, let him come down from the cross right now, and then we'll really believe that he is. He trusted in God. Let God deliver him now. If he's that keen on him, after all, he did say he was God's son. The thieves who were crucified alongside him heaped insults on him as well. From noon until mid-afternoon, there was darkness over the whole land. About the middle of the afternoon, Jesus shouted out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, what did you abandon me for? Some of the people who were standing there heard it and said, This fellow's calling Elijah. One of them ran at once and got a sponge. He filled it with vinegar, put it on a reed, and gave him a drink. The others said, Wait a bit. Let's see if Elijah is going to come and rescue him. But Jesus shouted out loudly one more time and then breathed his last breath. At that instant, the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks were split, and the tombs burst open. Many bodies of the sleeping holy ones were raised. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city where they appeared to several people. When the centurion and the others with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they were scared out of their wits. He really was God's son, they said. Several women were there watching from a distance. They followed Jesus from Galilee and had given him assistance. They included Mary Magdalene, 
Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of Zebedee's sons. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Here are some thoughts from our author, Tom Wright. Overwhelmed with horror at what we are seeing, we join the crowds as they hurry along behind the soldiers with their prisoner. Forget the calm tableau of so many historic paintings of the scene, with Mary and John standing at a discreet distance from the foot of Jesus' cross. In the Middle East, then as now, there were always more people in the crowd than would fit into the small streets, always people pushing and shoving. The soldiers might keep people at arm's length, but not much more. There were probably 50 people within 10 feet of Jesus, jostling, shouting, jeering, pointing, spitting, some weeping. You could tell the story a thousand different ways, and they'd all be true. Jesus' followers quickly came to tell it in such a way as to bring out what Jesus himself had been trying to say all along and what Matthew has been trying to tell us throughout his gospel. This is the event through which Jesus became king, king of the Jews, king of the world. To see how Matthew has done this, you have to imagine yourself in that crowd as someone who has prayed and sung the psalms all your life. The psalms turn the hard lumps of Israel's story and hopes into liquid poetry, flowing along like a great river, carrying you with it. And as you stand at the foot of the cross, you have a nightmarish sequence of flashbacks, of deja vu moments, watching Israel's hopes and dreams come to life, or rather to death, in front of your eyes. Bits and pieces of the Psalms acted out right there. Jesus is offered sour wine to drink. They cast lots for his clothes. They hail him as king of the Jews. They mock him with his own words. After three hours of darkness, Jesus screams out the words that begin the psalm, Psalm 22, where some of those things happen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The fulfillment has come, and it is a moment of utter terror and hopelessness. It is as though the sun were to rise one day and it would be a black sun bringing a darkness deeper than the night itself. As you stand there in this strange, powerful mixture of recognition and horror, bring bit by bit into the picture the stories on which you have lived. Bring the hopes you had when you were young. Bring the bright vision of family life, of success in sport or work or art, the dreams of exciting adventures in far-off places. Bring the joy of seeing a new baby, full of promise and possibility. Bring the longings of your heart. They are all fulfilled here, though not in the way you imagined. This is the way God fulfilled the dreams of his people. This is how the coming king would overcome all his enemies or bring the fears and sorrows you had when you were young, the terror of violence, perhaps at home, the shame of failure at school, of rejection by friends, the nasty comments that hurt you then and hurt you still. The terrible moment when you realized a wonderful relationship had come to an end. The sudden meaningless death of someone you loved very much. They are all fulfilled here too. 
God has taken them upon himself in the person of his Son. This is the earthquake moment, the darkness at noon moment, the moment of terror and sudden faith, as even the hard-boiled Roman soldier blurts out at the end, don't forget that the Son of God was a regular title claimed by Caesar, his boss. But then bring the hopes and sorrows of the world. Bring the millions who are homeless because of flood or famine. Bring the children orphaned by AIDS or war. Bring the politicians who begin by longing for justice and end up hoping for bribes. Bring the beautiful and the fragile earth on which we live. Think of God's dreams for his creation and God's sorrow at its ruin. As we stand there by the cross, let the shouting and pushing and the angry faces fade away for a moment and look at the slumped head of Jesus. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in him here on the cross. God chose Israel to be his way of rescuing the world. God sent Jesus to be his way of rescuing Israel. Jesus went to the cross to fulfill that double mission. His cross planted in the middle of the jostling, uncomprehending, mocking world of his day and ours stands as a symbol of a victory unlike any other, a love unlike any other, a God unlike any other. Our prayer for today, thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you bore that day. Thank you for your victory, the victory of love and justice. Thank you that you are the Son of God. Amen. And may God bless you and keep you until we meet again.